Uh, my name's Callum, part of the leadership team here at Gateway, and this morning we're continuing in our series in John. Um, so if, you can, if you've got a Bible with you, if you can turn to John, that would be good. Um, as I was told by Colin earlier this week, I have pulled the short straw, and I'm the unlucky person that has to follow after Zeke's fantastic preach last week, which was really very good, Zeke. Um, and if you remember back to that, Jesus has come into Jerusalem for Passover. Um, he's gone into the temple. He's made a whip. He's turned over all the tables. He's driven out the animals and the uh, money changers um, from the court of the Gentiles. And that's where we pick up the story, really. So Jesus is still in Jerusalem, and he's just had this kerfuffle in the temple. And then there's these odd, three odd little verses right at the end of chapter 2, which is actually where I'm going to start uh, reading from today. Um, I know Ziki did them last week, but just because I think they provide a bit of a helpful context for who Nicodemus is, who is the character that we are going to meet today. So we're going to start in John chapter 2, starting in verse 23, and we're going to read all the way through to John chapter 3, verse 21. Now, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, the people who saw the signs and believed in him because of that, because he knew all people, and he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So let's just pause there for a second and just point out. So Jesus doesn't entrust himself to, to a certain group of people, those who believe in his name because of they've seen the signs that he's doing, because he knows what's in their hearts. He knows what's in man. And then we have a man called Nicodemus who comes to Jesus and says to Jesus, you must be a man of God because look at the signs that you're doing. Yet, yeah, do you see the link that Nicodemus is one of the people that Jesus does not entrust himself to? Um, so this is why Jesus just completely ignores everything that Nicodemus says and tells Nicodemus exactly what he needs to hear, which is verse 3. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, which is literally, amen, amen, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. And so it is with everyone who's born of the spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we've seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I've told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, this is where most commentators think that Jesus and Nicodemus' conversation ends, and John, who wrote the gospel, picks up in verse 16 with the most, probably the most famous Bible verse in history. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever doesn't believe is condemned already, because he hasn't believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and doesn't come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the word of the Lord. 
So we have a book club uh, at Gateway, which if you didn't know, you should join after the meeting. Um, the last book that we read in our book club was Everything Sad is Untrue by um, Daniel Nayeri. Daniel is an Iranian um, who fled to the US as a child with his mother and his sister as refugees after they converted to Christianity. Um, and he's written this fantastic uh, memoir story about his experiences. Um, he's an adult now, but he's written it from the perspective of him as a teenager. We read some good books, so you really should, uh, you really should join us. And I just want to read what Daniel writes about his mum. He says, My mum was a Sayed, which he says earlier means master or holy one. My mum was a Sayed from the bloodline of the prophet. In Iran, if you convert from Islam to Christianity or Judaism, it's a capital crime. That means if they find you guilty in religious court, they kill you. And when my sister walked out of her room and said she'd met Jesus, my mum knew that. And here's the part that gets hard to believe. Seema, my mum, read about him and she became a Christian too. Not just a regular one who keeps it in their pocket. She fell in love. She wanted everyone to have what she had, to be free, to realise that in other religions you've got rules and codes and obligations to follow to earn good things. But all you had to do with Jesus was believe he was the one who died for you. And she believed. And when I tell the story in Oklahoma, this is the part where the grown-ups always interrupt me. They say, okay, but why did she convert? Because up to that point, I've told them about the house with the birds in the walls, all the villages that my grandfather owned, all the gold, my mum's medical practice, all the amazing things she had that we don't have anymore because she became a Christian. All the money she gave up, so we're poor now. But I don't have an answer for them. So I just say what my mum says when people ask her. She looks them in the eye with a begging hope that they'll hear her, and she says, because it's true. Why else would she believe it? It's true, and it's more valuable than $7 million in gold coins and thousands of acres of Persian countryside and 10 years of education to get a medical degree and all of your family and a home and the best cream puffs of Jolfa and even maybe your life. My mum wouldn't have made the trade otherwise. If you believe it's true that there's a son, that there's a God and he wants you to believe in him and he sent his son to die for you, then it has to take over your life. It has to be worth more than everything else because heaven's waiting on the other side. That, or Seema, is insane. There is no middle. You can't say it's just the quirky thing she thinks sometimes because she went all the way with it. And if it's not true, she made a giant mistake. But she doesn't think so. She had all that wealth, the love of all those people she helped in her clinic. They treated her like a queen. She was a Sayed. And she's poor now. People spit on her on buses. She's a refugee in places people hate refugees, with a husband who hits her harder than a second-degree black belt because he's a third-degree black belt. And she'll tell you it's worth it. Jesus is better. It's true. Seema, who was such a fierce Muslim that she marched for the revolution, who studied the Quran the way very few people do, read the Bible, and knew in her heart that it was true. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. This whole story hinges on it. What an incredible story. <laughs> um, really, an incredible story of what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about, about what it means to be born again. Sema believed in Jesus, and it cost her almost everything in the world that she knew. Family, friends, wealth, status, a marriage, a home, a country, she got a completely new life, completely different life. A new life, in fact, that was a lot harder than the one that she had before. But as Daniel says in his book, Jesus was worth it. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning, about being born again, or the new birth. And we're going to ask a few simple questions. What is the new birth, and what does it do? Where does the new birth come from, and how does it come and who is it for, and how do you know when it's come? So that first question, what is the new birth, and what does it do? Well, to state the obvious, it's a birth. 
Jesus doesn't use the metaphor of some kind of spiritual awakening from a sleep. He doesn't use the metaphor that it's used elsewhere in Scripture of a seed being planted. It's a birth. He uses the metaphor of a baby being born. It's not a top-up to a moral life. It's a birth. It's not an add-on to something that you do already. It's a new birth, a new life. And Leslie Newbegin says it's not simply a matter of illumination. It's a matter of regeneration. It's not just new seeing, but a new being. And that's, what's, that's what happened to Seema, isn't it? I mean, she literally had an utterly new life, a new way of being. It cost her almost everything from her old life. And as I said, her new life wasn't always easy either. And in fact, the birth that Jesus, the new birth that Jesus talks about can be horrendously painful, just as it was for Seema. In verse 20 of that passage, John says that people fear it because when they come to the light, their works are exposed. Have any of you read uh, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader in Chronicles of Narnia? Well, there's a story in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader of um, Eustace, and Eustace becomes a dragon because he gets greedy. And after thinking he's going to be a dragon forever, Aslan comes to him in the night and leads him to a luscious garden where there's a pool in the middle of the garden. And he tells Eustace to bathe in the pool, but he tells him that he's going to have to undress first. But being a dragon, Eustace doesn't have any clothes on, so he assumes that Aslan means his skin. And so he starts scratching at his scaly skin, and eventually he manages to peel it off. But as he goes to step into the pool, he looks down at his feet and he knows that there was more, he notices that there was more dragon skin underneath. And so he begins to scratch again and peels it off again and again and again before he realizes he's unable to peel it off himself. And Aslan tells him that because Eustace isn't able to undress himself, he will do it for him. And so he takes his great big lion claws and he scratches at Eustace. And Eustace says that it is the most painful thing he has ever experienced. But by the end, every last shred of scaly skin is off. And Aslan pushes Eustace into the pool in the middle of the garden. And Eustace still initially feels more pain because his skin is so sensitive. But after a time of being in the pool, he finds refreshment. And he finds healing as he bathes. And when he comes out of the water... He's transformed. He's finally human again. And the new birth, again, is a little bit like that. It's often painful, but it is utterly transformative. You come out a new kind of creature, a new being, a new human. And that's because the new birth is powerful. There is power in it to transform you. Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God." Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And whoever believes in him may have or possess eternal life, which is John's normal phrase for the kingdom of God. So as we're born again, we see or we know the kingdom of God. Whereas maybe previously we've heard about it, we've known about it, but we haven't seen it, we haven't understood it. Now we see and we know. Not only do we see and know, but we enter and we possess the kingdom of God. And as a Pharisee, Nicodemus would have thought of the kingdom of God as something that was going to happen far off in the future. Something that the Messiah would bring in that would usher in a new kingdom where all things would be made right. And so Jesus is saying to Nicodemus uh, that something he thought of as only going to happen off in the distant future that he probably wouldn't live to see is something that he can see now, and not just see, but enter and possess. And Tim Keller says this, John is saying that the new birth is from the future. The new birth is the power that God is going to use to regenerate the whole world brought into your present. It's not complete, it's only partial, but it is the future coming into you. It's God's future coming into your heart right now. And he goes on to say, so don't ever underestimate the power of the new birth to change somebody. There is no fear 
There is no guilt. There is no hurt. There is no flaw that the new birth can't at least partially repair. He says, don't settle for only little change if you have been born again. And with that power and that new birth comes a completely new identity. When each of us were born, we were born into a family, right? It might have been a good family, it might have been a bad family, but we were each born into a family. And I assume it's still the same now, but when uh, my kids were born, uh, they had a little wristband or footband, I can't remember which, uh, put on them. And on Eli's, it said, boy of Katie Limpany. And on Rose's, it said, girl of Katie Limpany. And I remember the first time I saw it with Eli, and I was a bit like, he's my child too. Um, Could you not have written Katie and Callum? Um, But when you're born, you are identified by who has given birth to you. Sure, I had a part to play without making any inappropriate jokes. (laughs) But I didn't carry them for nine months. I didn't nourish them. I didn't labor over them. I didn't give my body up for them. Katie did. Katie birthed them. And so, when they're born, they're identified as Katie's. And it is the same for this new birth. You receive a new identity. You're born into a new family. You're now identified by who has given birth to you. Your wristband no longer says child of Katie Limpany or whoever. It says child of God. Remember chapter 1 of John's Gospel? But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, which is the same thing as being born again, as we'll see, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Which leads us nicely on to our second question. Where does the new birth come from, and how does it come? And again, to state um, the obvious, it comes from God. And we're given a few pretty clear clues to help us get there. When Jesus says to Nicodemus that you must be born again, Nicodemus takes Jesus very literally. How can a man be born when he's old? Is he he supposed to enter his mother's womb again and be born a second time? And whether he's being sarcastic or just completely misunderstanding doesn't matter too much. What's interesting is that that phrase, born again, um, that word again is a Greek word, anathen, And it can mean born from above. As John said in chapter 1, it is not a birth of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's not a literal birth, it is a birth from above. And Jesus unpacks that for Nicodemus. He next says, unless one's born of water and the spirit. So being born again is the same thing as being born of water and the spirit. What does that mean? Well, some might say that Jesus is saying you need to be baptized in water and have the Holy Spirit to be born again. I don't think that's very likely, partly because he doesn't use the word baptism, he uses the word water. But it's more likely that water is a metaphor for the Spirit, because I think Jesus has in mind Ezekiel chapter 36 when he is having this conversation with Nicodemus, where Ezekiel talks about the Spirit of God as water. He says, Ezekiel... I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you, and I'll cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. So being born of water and the spirit, being born again or born from above means having God's Spirit put within you. It is something that God does to us through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus unpacks it a little more in verse 7 and 8, where he says, Don't marvel, don't be surprised that I said you should be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. And the same is true for everyone who's born of the Spirit. And that word for wind... Uh, the wind blows where it wishes, is the Greek word, uh, I hate using Greek words, but there is the Greek word pneuma. And you might have a little footnote in your Bible that says that the same Greek word for wind can mean wind or spirit or breath. So the spirit, the wind, the breath blows where it wants to. We can experience it, but we cannot control it. We can't make it happen ourselves, just like Eustace 
Uh, he couldn't take the skin off himself. Aslan had to do it for him. Aslan had to push him in the pool. We can't do it ourselves. It is something God has to do to us. And we see that actually in the very next chapter of Ezekiel, which I think Jesus also has in mind here too, Ezekiel 37, where Ezekiel receives a vision from God. And he says, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And he said to me, prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath, wind, spirit to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and cover you with skin and put breath or spirit in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath, spirit, came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. This is what happens when we're born of water and the spirit. In our old life, we are like dry bones. We are dead. Bones cannot make themselves alive. It is the breath, the spirit, the wind of God breathing into us new life. So it comes from above, but how does it come? Well, there's a progression in how Jesus unpacks this for Nicodemus. So he starts with, you must be born again. He goes to, you must be born with water and the spirit. And he ends it and packs it further still in verse 15 by saying, you must believe in him. We simply to believe in Jesus. And Jesus talks about this serpent in the wilderness, which is a story from Numbers 21, where um, the Israelites are wandering around in the desert after God has rescued them from slavery to Egypt. Um, but they are already getting bored. They're already complaining at God. They're already getting tired of, of journeying with him. And so God sends snakes amongst his people, and the snakes bite the people. They're poisonous snakes, and some of them fall ill and die. And so they repent of their sin before God. And God says to Moses, uh, make a bronze serpent on a pole and put it up in the middle of the camp. And every person who's been bitten by the snake or by a snake it just has to look at the bronze serpent and they'll be healed. They'll be saved from death. And Jesus says it's the same way for him. What does believing in Jesus look like? It looks like gazing at Jesus lifted up. Both lifted up on the cross as we see him in all his glory, as John says in chapter 1. But also lifted up in his ascension to the right hand of the Father where we see him reigning and ruling as king over all. We are to gaze at Jesus. That is it. So we've looked at where, where the new birth, what the new birth is and what it does. We've looked at where it comes from and how it comes. And now we're going to look at who it is for and how you know when it's come. And the first thing that we're going to do is compare um, the story of Nicodemus and the story of the Samaritan woman in chapter 4. Because John has set these two stories in contrast on purpose. And John does this a lot in his Gospels. He creates contrasts often between model disciples, so people who encounter Jesus, come to know him, follow him, believe in his name, and witness to others, and not so model disciples, people who encounter Jesus and for whatever reason get stuck somewhere along the way on the journey after that. And in this contrast that he sets up, the Samaritan woman is set up as the model disciple, and Nicodemus is set up as the not-so-model disciple. So there are the obvious contrasts. Nicodemus is a Jewish man, and she is a Samaritan woman. He is wealthy, and she is poor. 
He is of an upper social class, and she is of a lower social class. He is an educated Pharisee. He says he's the ruler of the Jews, which means he's a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling council. Um, And Jesus also calls him the teacher of Israel, which probably means that he's the most well-known, well-respected teacher in Israel at the time. Whereas the Samaritan woman is uneducated, sinful seemingly, she's had multiple partners, probably been divorced, possibly even outcast from society, which is maybe why she's at the well in the heat of the day. And then there are the less obvious contrasts as well. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the night. And sure, maybe it might have been that he just had trouble getting in Jesus' diary. Um, But I think it's more likely that he was afraid of being seen with Jesus because of who he was. And John's use of light and darkness in verses 19 to 21 of this passage probably points to that as well. The Samaritan woman encounters Jesus in the middle of the day. Nicodemus leaves Jesus confused. The last words we get from Nicodemus are, how can these things be? He never moves past his encounter to actually knowing, understanding Jesus. But the Samaritan woman starts confused. She takes Jesus very literally, just like Nicodemus does in this passage. But there's also a progression in how she comes to know him. So she starts off by calling him a Jew. And then she says, I see that you're a prophet. And by the end, she realizes that he's the Messiah. Nicodemus doesn't come, at least in this story, to follow Jesus. Now, there is a bit of debate about whether his other two appearances in this gospel mean that he ever does become a disciple of Jesus, but at least he doesn't in this story. But the Samaritan woman does come to believe in Jesus, and what's the first thing she does? She goes back to her town, and she tells everybody about Jesus. And it says that many come to believe in Jesus because of her testimony. And John is doing two things here. Firstly, like I said, he's saying, be like the Samaritan woman, don't be like Nicodemus. Be like Tzema in the story, don't be like the regular Christians that keep it in their pocket. Um, But he's also saying that anyone can come to Jesus. Educated or uneducated, sinful or religious, wealthy or poor, well-respected or shunned by society, upper class, working class, all can come to Jesus. The invitation to be born again is for everyone. And John makes it even more explicit in this passage. John 3.16, as I said, probably the most loved and well-known passage in the Bible. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. Not the religious, not the moral, not the wealthy or the upright. For God so loved the world, everyone, all of us, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever doesn't believe is condemned already. Do you, get, do you see the emphasis again and again? The world, whoever, for everyone, all. Sinner or saint, moral or immoral, Pharisee or divorcee, Jew and Gentile, men and women, educated and uneducated, prostitutes, tax collectors, lepers, and the demonized, all can come to Jesus and be born again. You and me, it is for all of us. You must be born again. We must be born again. So how do you know if you have been born again? I'm making it as simple as I can. Again, it's a birth. It's experiential, isn't it? It's, we have all been born. You know when you've been born. It's not possible to not know if you've been born. If you're living, you've been born. Tim Keller, again, he says that being born means you have, he's talking about as a baby, being born means that you have a new sensibility. What do I mean by sensibility? All living things sense their environment, even the simplest ones. And a baby being born immediately sees for the first time, hears fully for the first time. When they're brought out into the world, they're brought out into a world of amazing sensations. You get the picture? A newly born baby sees bright lights for the first time, hears clear sounds for the first time, gets kissed on the head for the first time. It crosses over from a place of quiet and dark to a place, a whole new world of sensation and noise and hunger and touch and feeling. 
And Tim Keller goes on to say, the way that you know you've been born again is both your mind is illumined and your heart is moved. The spiritual truth that you might have heard before but didn't make sense to your mind or certainly didn't touch your heart now does. You know you've been born again because you've experienced it, just like the wind that Jesus talked about. We can't control it. It does what it wishes, but we can hear it. We can experience it. And as I said at the start, it might be painful. Your works will get exposed before God in the light. But it's not painful and exposing because God is punishing us. It's painful and exposing because it's a birth. Your head is squeezed out of a pretty small hole. (laughs) You come out crying, don't you? You come out naked, bare to the world, exposed for all to see. And it is exactly the same with the new birth. Birth is painful and it's exposing. But just like Eustace in the pool, it doesn't stay that way for long because you inherit eternal life. You get the joy of life with God, with a new family. For all eternity, you find refreshment, healing for your soul. You find salvation. It's an act of love, not of condemnation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, whoever is born again of water and the spirit should not perish, but will see, enter, and possess eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So the invitation this morning is exactly the same for each of us as it was for Nicodemus. Be born again. Have you been born again? Have you experienced the new birth? Do you know this morning? Can I invite everybody to stand, please, just as I come to a finish? Sam, are you happy just to come up and... We've only got a few minutes, but I just want us to respond, if that's okay, if there is anybody who wants to respond. Um, So I'm just going to give a few groups of people, and then at the end, I'm going to invite you just to come to the front. Um, If you know this morning that you have never been born again, that you have never given your life to Jesus, never believed in him, you're faced with the same decision as Nicodemus. Are you going to believe and be born again? Are you going to perish or are you going to inherit eternal life? And if that's you and you want to believe to be born again for the first time this morning, I'm going to just invite you to make your way up to the front in a minute. There's nothing special about the front, as we try and say often. But it's often as we make a step forward in faith physically that God does something in our hearts. And I wonder actually if this morning there's a bit of a symbolic action as well, as of stepping out of the darkness towards the light of Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been in church for a long time, but actually this morning you're like, have I ever been born again? Do I know? Have I ever experienced that? Well, you can know with certainty this morning And so if you fall into that category, I'd just like to invite you up to the front in a minute as well. And finally, if you know that you've been born again, but you hear that story of somebody like Seema, and you want to know a kind of faith like that, the kind of faith that's worth losing everything for, that's worth giving your life for, that's worth everything If you want to have the kind of faith that Tim Keller talks about, like there is no fear, no guilt, no flaw that it cannot repair, I just want to invite you to the front as well. So if you fall into one of those three groups, if there's no one, it's fine, but if you fall into one of those three groups, can I just invite you to just be bold for a minute and make your way up to the front? And we've got some people who will come and pray. If you're on the prayer team, 
and you're happy just to pray, are you happy to come and do that? The rest of us, just for a few minutes, who are still in our seats, we're going to worship together. Just one song, if that's all right. And we're going to thank God for what we have received in Christ Jesus. So let me just pray, and then I'll hand over to Sam. Father, I thank you that the invitation is for us to be born again. God, not to try hard, not to work at our own life, God, but to be born again, to trust in you. And Father, even in the moments of pain and exposure, God, we trust in you that it will not remain that way, but we will find refreshment and healing and salvation. Father, so for those who have just responded this morning, Lord Jesus, I pray, would you fill them with your spirit? God, even as they've stepped out in front of everybody else here, would you fill them with your spirit? God, would they be born again this morning? Would they know that kind of faith like Sema? Would they know that new birth that has the power to change everything in their life, to turn it upside down? God, for their joy and for your glory, God, would you bless them, I pray? Would you fill them with your spirit this morning? God, and for each of us here who have been born again, who have the joy of knowing you already, Father, I pray, will we worship with glad hearts. God, will we go from this place knowing that you have called us to something more than an add-on to life, that moral living, but you have called us, Father, to your kingdom. God, you have called us to, in, to eternal life. God, and so may we go from this place full of power and full of your spirit, God, not to... Uh, not to be regular Christians who keep it in their pocket, God, but to share the love that we have encountered with this world. So come, Holy Spirit, and fill us, I pray, and be glorified in us. Amen.